All right, testing, testing, one, two, three. We'll see if anybody can hear me out there. Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> I'm on time. Where are you guys? <laughs> All righty, let's see. <laughs> Man, all right, check, 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 bark these, oh, you can't see that, oh, see the screen, that's why I should do share the screen, okay, people can hear me, so let's see if you can see what I see. And in some parts of the country, it's aliens attacking. <laughs> I love that. Where was that? Where are aliens attacking? Oh, here, oh, in Peru. It wasn't our country. Peru. <laughs> Peru means of being attacked by predator type aliens. <laughs> it's like a mass hysteria they're like all swearing it's happening floating aliens wow that's even cooler screen's good okay let's check out some aliens uh <laughs> i was contemplating i was like this is not news the aliens are immune to their hunting weapons wow Okay, it's the indigenous people who have claimed they are being ambushed by armored figures, which look like, I think it's just um, loggers trying to drive them out of their place. Wow. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. <laughs> uh, anyway, all right. Well, if anybody sees any seven foot tall, Predator-looking aliens. Make sure they're not the authorities. But there you go. Who's reporting this? The Daily Mail. It's a real newspaper. Um, Vibe. Express. I don't know what Express is. It's an, I mean, that just more news. Let me see. I'm just curious how many people are carrying this. The Daily Mail, the Daily Express, Metro, Days, the U.S. Sun, don't know what that is. Sports data. Oh, no, that's... <laughs> All right, so it hasn't really made it to the mainstream, mainstream media yet, but do keep on the lookout just in case. So meanwhile, in just as unreliable news, we can look at the market. And uh, we're getting... A little bit of support, but it's not very exciting. Let's look at the uh, Finviz chart. It actually gives you better details. Assuming that's working. This Finviz, they keep changing their web pages to shove more and more ads down your throat, and it makes it worse and worse, and the performance is terrible. And then they change the, they, they put on these incredibly obnoxious ads like a week ago, and then it ruined the whole site. And I think they got the message and took it back off. But holy cow. I mean, I mean, people are just, I mean, they're very desperate for money. I got to say that all these, a lot of people, I mean, you see in a lot of things and people are doing crazy stuff, trying to get more money out of you. And they're pushing it too far. A lot of them. So. Where are we? The Dow. So look, 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 look at the pattern we have here. I mean, this is not good so far. This is, you know, and again, this is what bounces are all about, right? So you got 35.6 to 30, back to 35.1. That's a 500 point drop. And that means a weak bounce is 35.2 and a strong bounce is 35.3. So the weak bounce line in this case held up 
on that drop, and now we have to see if they get back over 35.3. Once they get over 35.3, once they're over a strong bounce, and a strong bounce is very simple. It's 35.6 minus 35.1 is 500, and then you divide that by, then it's 20% for each significant move. So that means you're down to 100 point moves, and you have the weak bounce, the strong bounce, a strong retrace, a weak retrace, and then you're back to where you were. So a weak retrace is the 35.5 line. It failed that, that's not a good sign. Strong retrace, 35.4, failed that too. So now you're all the way down. The strong bounce didn't even begin to hold up. And now you hit the weak bounce and you finally get a little bit of support. But because of the way it's been acting, I would guess we're gonna fail that strong bounce and come all the way back down to 35.1 and retest the weak bounce. And it's not going to be any different for these. I mean, you can tell by the shape of it that they're not going to be that different. Um, and the NASDAQ looks worse. I'm going to need calculator probably for some of this. But that's all it is. It's not complicated. I mean, the, you know, the 5% rule is not supposed to be complicated. It just shows the tendency of things to act a certain way. So in the S&P, and again, it's where are you forming, and this is what's also very important, where are you forming a, a, a pattern of resistance where is it where's the significant support line or resistance line being formed so really 35.1 is a bit of a stretch and it didn't really get to 35.6 and you can narrow the range but if you narrow the range you'll find the same numbers <laughs> it'll not the same numbers but you have the same this will still say it's a weak bounce because um you narrow the range and then this range becomes less than uh, 100 it becomes 70 or something like that and now you're at 32.45, so you haven't made the bounce. Um, so for the S&P, 45.40, 44, I, I got to call that, I'm going to call 90 the support line. But if you do that, you're in trouble. If See, you have to think about that too. If you call 90 the support line, we're only at 93. So we, we are all the way down. So 45.40, 45, 40, 45 90 is 50. See, it always works out, right? <laughs> it turns out to be 50. That means that 44.90 is your theoretical support. 45 is a weak bounce. Okay. Although really, now here's where judgment comes in. Though really, I would say 45 is probably the support. And if we make this chart bigger, we'll probably see why. Yeah, there you go. So I'd say really 45 is kind of support. And these are short term. Short terms are volatile. You got to use your judgment. But let's say 45 is support. That means we're below the support. And if we're below the support, what was the support? It was from 46.20 to 45. That's a 120 point drop. So now we take that times 20% is 25. And that means every 25 points is significant. So was there a 25 point overshoot down to 75? Yeah, pretty much. So this is just the overshoot to 45. So 45 is still support. It overshot the mark. If it climbs right back over, that's fine. But below 45, if you start consolidating down here, then you've got to pull back the chart and look for a bigger range to say, well, if that's not holding up, then what's happening? Well, 45 was a significant breakout point when it finally came. We went up to 46, whatever, 20. Now we're back down to 45. So the problem is 45 had a run from where? 45 had a run from 41. Can we say it's from 4,000? Not really. We got to we got to call this like 4150. This is going to get messy. So we'll call that 4150. So now I'm more worried about the downside than the upside. So now it's going to be like 4500 minus 4150. Divide that, 350, divide that by five is 70. So every 70 points, now I go back and I see if 70 points actually mattered from 4,500. So where's 4,570? Here. Was that a significant anything? Well, it was over here. So this is a confirming. You see, it confirms that there's a whole day almost of movement at 45.70, so it was a significant point. It was also a breakup point over here. So yes, it checks. So that's what you do. You go and back test it and take a look at the the different places. So 40, in other words, if 45.70 is a significant support line 
on the uh, daily chart, then it should be significant on the hourly chart, right? It, it doesn't make sense if the daily if the daily has a support line and the hourly can't confirm it. That that doesn't make any sense. So you want to see that there's some com com confirmation. Given my words today, and this is that confirmation around 45.70 that we saw. All right, so that's the point. You back out to the uh, to the next chart. And you see, and then if you want to confirm further, you go out to the weekly chart and say where your support is. And we want to see here if 45 is a real line. And yeah, 45 is a real line. The run up to 45, did we have good consolidation under 4,000? I would, I'd have to say it's a reasonable. And also you get into the really long-term stuff and yes, for sure, 4,000 is significant. 2,000 is significant. You can see this, it's like a, this is like a year and a half at 2,000. So that's significant. Three would be 50% up from 2,000, very significant. And then four, and that's where we were kind of, it's, it's a zigzag, but we're still around four, which was at the line we said it would be at way back when, the, when we crashed. When we crashed, we predicted four. That's, that was what we figured was a fair value for the S&P. We raised it to 44, which is not here. 44 is here. We raised our fair value to 44, but mostly because of inflation. No other reason, just this, we know it's the same earnings, it's the same stocks, it's the same thing, but we expected that it would go, we gave it a, we gave it the benefit of the doubt and said it would go higher due to inflation, but that chart is not holding up. And keep in mind, I think all charting is bullshit, okay? But it's still there's still an indication of the chart having a value you can't predict anything from looking at a chart but you can see a story you can see the you can see the tracks it made all right so in other words i can't tell you where a car is going based on the, where it's been but i can tell you where it came from with absolute certainty because that's a fact right so this is a fact all this is fact all this is speculation and the further out you try to speculate, the more wildly off you're going to be. Oh, speaking of which, where is that? Uh, yeah, no, wrong one. Damn it, that would have been so cool if I got on my first try. Um, <laughs> there was a Fed thing that I was looking at. Where did you go? Did I, did I use aliens attack to get rid of it? Anyway, it was their GDP now. It was very interesting how much how much higher they've made it. We'll take a look later. Ah, we don't need this, so let's go. GDP now. It's just been updated. <laughs> look at this. This is a Q3 estimate from the Atlanta Fed. 3.5 to 4% in uh, uh, GDP growth. Nobody predicted that for the third quarter. That's what they're on. That's what they're tracking now. Where are people expecting it? 0.5%. So the Fed, for whatever reason, believes the economy is growing much faster than most people think. And the problem with that, though, is that that's going to keep the Fed firmly on the table because the economy is growing essentially out of control. 5% growth for the U.S. is out of control. Um, and that causes more labor shortages and more and more inflation and so on and so forth. So that's bad. So we've given the S&P the benefit of the doubt and made our new chart. Oh, this is our old S&P chart. That's interesting. Let's go get our new S&P chart. Um, I forgot how that works. If I go here. And I go there, and then I find the most recent S&P chart, not 2021. <sighs> July 3rd, 2023, that's got to be it. Okay, what? <laughs> oh, because that's below. Oh, it is the same chart. Silly me. Oh, no, it's not. I'm sorry. Here we go. <laughs> Stupid brain. All right, let's see. So I detach this. Yes, correct. Oh, almost had it. I made that smaller. I move. No, no. 
you can go away. You're a separate thing. There we go. Now we got some fancy stuff going on. Oh, except how did you get to there? NASDAQ SPX. Okay, so here we go. So I'm trying to line up the 4,000 lines. All right, let's see if we can squeeze this guy up a bit. We'll do that. That's fine. Ooh, look how cool this is. Okay. <clears throat> so two things are going on here. <clears throat> this is our old chart. We thought 4,000 was the proper range for the S&P into the end of last year, and it was. That's where we ended up. So we were correct. This year, we raised it to 4,400, added 10%, not because corporate profits are greater, not because anything else. I mean, corporate profits are improving, but they're improving because they're being inflated. It's like everything else. The, you know, you're, you know, you were selling, you were selling a hundred dollars worth. You were selling ten apples for ten dollars, right? So you're selling a hundred dollars worth of apples, and you're making two apples in profit, twenty percent. Okay, so your profit is twenty dollars on a hundred. Now inflation comes in, and inflation is over the last couple of over the last couple of years, or since we made this chart in 2021. Or I'm sorry, 2020, 2020. Since we made this chart in 2020 in the COVID crash, there's been basically 20% inflation. You know, 15 or 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 at least 10, you know, more than 10 anyway in the last few years. Um, so now you have. A hundred, now you're selling your apples, your same hundred app, you're selling the same 10 apples for $120 now. Didn't sell more apples, didn't make more apples, didn't improve the economy. What you've done is you are now charging more for the same goods and services. So now you're charging $120 for 10 apples and you're making the same 10% profit, but now that profit instead of being 20 is $22. So your profits are up 10%. All right, but it's total bullshit because the 10% profit that you make when you go to buy whatever you're buying from somebody else, you're paying that in cost. So your, your extra profits are just going to feed the inflation to somebody else. That's why inflation is generally, it's not really a good thing. It doesn't help anybody. And it just and 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 the people who and the people who get wages are usually the last people to have their uh, positions improved, so they fall further and further behind. And the companies, because the companies would rather declare the extra ten percent profit than give it to the workers like they should, <laughs> which is why the auto workers are about to go on strike. Anyway, so. So we raised the bar 10% only because earnings inflation makes it look like the S&P companies are making more money. Therefore, the index has at the same multiple would give you more money, would make, you, would, make, would make it a higher valuation. But it's really nothing about profit. It's got nothing to do with success. There is nothing good going on here. The only thing, and also, by the way, don't forget, so... You were able to buy 100 apples for $100, and they made $20, and everybody was happy. Now we have inflation. You're still buying 100 apples, but now it's $120, and they're making $22. So it looks okay for the corporations. And there is no, nobody tells you this in the financial media. Nobody ever says it, and nobody ever gets on, explains it, and says, this is all bullshit. Stop looking at these numbers. Stop thinking you're getting some kind of bargain or that stocks are on some kind of roll in profits. They don't ever sit there and say this very simple concept. It's not hard to explain, but they'll sit there and tell you how how they're making record profits and this and that. It's bullshit. It's total bullshit. Um, it's just that the profit they make looks bigger because of inflation, but it's also going to turn around and cost them when they go to get when they go to 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 create the next 20, 10 apples that they're selling. You know, it's going to cost them more money and they will no longer show a profit, but it's a cycle and it takes 
time. They plant the seeds. The seeds cost more money. The workers come in. The workers cost more money. The machine that picks the apples off the tree or whatever they use in the baskets that they put the apples in and the marketing guy who they give the, the apples to and the TV commercials for the apples, it all costs more money. But it doesn't cost more money now. Now they're making money. Now they raise the price of apples and they make 20% more or 10% more or whatever. So they raise the price of apples and make 20 extra dollars and you go, oh, look, they made 20 extra dollars, but then you're not looking forward at their costs are gonna be increasing. It's just bullshit. You're in a, you're in a, you're in a changing cyclic, cyclic, ugh, cyclical environment and you're just picking a slice and saying, oh, I'm going to look here and not anywhere else. And you can't do that. It's dangerous. And this is, again, where we're going to get back to the banks where that's happening. So anyway, so the chart doesn't change. It's the same chart. We're just adjusting the lines. And we're saying, okay, well, we're going to go from 4,000 to 4,400. That's a lot, though, because look, we, we moved up two, uh, two resistance points. We added two support lines to this, so we're putting our support above where the strong bounce line was before. And what we're saying, and this is why we expected the 50-day moving average to keep climbing higher. The 200-day moving average is, is miles below, but it's over 4,000. So, you know, when you're trading for 200 days above here, it's not that likely we're going to have a significant fall below 4,400. Maybe maybe back to 42, but even 42 is going to keep dragging this up. And eventually, that 200-day moving average is going to be, well, how long? It'll be about, it's about halfway. So how long did this take from July to August? So September, October, sometime around October, November, the 200-day moving average will cross this line. At that point, you have very, very strong support at 4,200, right? So therefore, it's not too likely we're going to fail 4,200. There'd have to be some pretty bad circumstances for us to drop to 4,200. 4,200 is only um, it's only 10% down on the S&P. So we're not really we don't see that it's likely we're going to go there. Why? The inflation's not going away. The prices aren't going to reverse. The companies will have trouble. They'll reset prices. Wages will reset, and it'll go round and round and round again until we find an equilibrium. But it's it's a delicate balance, okay? So it's like being it's like being on a surfboard. It's like, uh, you know, you have, you're have trying to, it's like two people on a surfboard. You're trying to keep it a balance between the company expenses and the company revenues and what they're charging. But don't forget, what's the problem? It's only 100 apples. Now you're paying $110 for 100 apples. Or 120, whatever the number we said. So now you're paying 100, whatever. 10% inflation would be 110, obviously. So you're paying $110 for 100 apples, and you're making 10% more profits. You were making 20, now you're making 22. That was the number I used before. Um, but where's the $20 coming from? Aha! <laughs> Where is that $20 coming from? It's not being earned by the workers. It's being drawn out of savings. It's being, it's not magic. It doesn't come from anywhere. Other things have to be sacrificed so you can buy your apples now, unless you got a significant raise. Unless you got the raise the UAW workers are asking for, you are not going to be able to keep affording to buy 10 apples. And what's going to happen then? If you can't afford to buy 10 apples, then the apple guy is going to have less revenues and he won't make his extra profit. He'll only sell 90 apples at, at the additional price and be at $99 in revenues instead of $100 that he used to be at. And um, and his profits won't be, and his profits won't have improved. And all of a sudden, everyone's going to dump his stock, even though he didn't do anything wrong, really. Just trying to keep up. You got And you've got to understand that's at the heart. That's where all these earnings reports, that's what they're telling us. You reach a point in inflation where you have they call it pushback from the consumer, but it's not pushback from the consumer. The consumer doesn't have the freaking money to pay for it. Why don't they have the money to pay for it? Because you didn't give them a raise. They don't have any more money. Just because you raise the price of, you know, when you take a Toyota, that was $40,000, and you say, okay, now it's $50,000, 20% higher, because Toyota's got to make their money. 
that does that doesn't mean everybody who buys a Toyota now has ten thousand more dollars to spend. So reluctantly or whatever, they'll switch to a Kia. They they have they can no longer afford a Toyota comfortably. It's no longer something affordable for for you to push people out of a range. And it only takes a very, very small amount of people to, to be pushed out of a range before you're not selling. All of a sudden you see uh, Hyundai or Kia or somebody like revenues go up because they're selling more cars. They raise their prices a few thousand dollars, five thousand dollars, whatever, and it was twenty percent of their car price too. But it, but their price started out way lower than Toyota, and now you push the Toyota people into the lower category. This is what happened with Ford with the F one fifties also. They they hit a price point. Where the customers were like, no, thank you. You know, $100,000 for an electric truck is a little crazy. You know, not for Elon Musk, but for, <laughs> not for the cult of Elon Musk. But anyway, so <clears throat> when we raise our, our level here, this is the aspirational S&P chart. And, and it's, it's not doing so badly. We raised this level, I think, in June. When we got back to here, I think we raised, we finally capitulated and said, okay, you know what, we're gonna we're gonna increase our target because we're gonna account for inflation and blah blah blah. So we increased it. It it immediately jumped up thanks to our increase, I guess. But what happens when we increase it? Well, we rose this 10%, but the gaps. If this baseline is now 10% higher, then the gaps are 10% wider. So that's interesting, right? So now our gaps have widened up. And the gaps now are 200 points. The gaps were 160 points. Now they're 200 points. Well, actually, I mean, it's a little more complicated than that because we also had to go back to it. We went back to a much larger chart, like the monthly chart on the S&P, and redid our lines. So now the strong retrace, in other words, the, the lowest point we believe that the S&P can get to is now 4,000. A weak retrace 4200, that's the more likely channel that we're stuck between 46 and 42. And we can see 42 again on a pullback um, until, like I said, until about November when the S&P, when the 200-day when the moving average comes up to meet um, the weak retrace line. Now, that weak retrace line used to be the, the weak bounce line. So this was the top of our range, 43.20. Now 43.20 is here. It's below our range. So the range has been adjusted. And this is what we're playing with now. This is our new, uh, I don't want to say reality, but it's our new situation anyway. All right. Anyway, I hope that was clear. Let's see if we have any questions. No questions. Fantastic. I am the best explainer of stuff. <laughs> So that's what we're working with now. I don't believe we should be so bullish. Um, you see what happened here? This this fell down. You see what happened here? This fell down. All right. And you, the, you're probably going to get some similar kind of action. So we're probably going to be coming down. And maybe we already did. They hit support. All right. Oh, by the way, this is another funny thing people don't understand about charts. At this time, this chart did not look like this. All right, in other words, if you go back to March, let's see if we can do that. Um, yeah, March, 2022, no. Wait, when was that date? No, that was this March, okay. Um, 2023, June, 2023, July, 2023. All right, June, 2023. Let's see how that looks. Hopefully it's a fixed picture. Oh, it's not a fixed picture. Damn it. Ah. All right. Anyway, you'll have to believe me then. That's <laughs> so what I was trying to say is at the time, though, these lines didn't look the same because the 200-day moving average is taking into account where you were. Um, as more and more data comes in, the line will tend to move. So you can't be sure that this is actually what these lines look like at the time. But either way, what you can be sure of, though, is how much did we fall? We fell one, basically, we fell one, um, one, I don't, I don't know what you call this thing, 
<laughs> we fell one sector, let's call it that. We fell one sector in the first round. We bounced, but not, it was a weak, it was, I'm sorry, it was a strong bounce. We had a strong bounce. And you can see by these boxes, we fell one, two, three, four boxes. We bounced back two boxes. And then we fell one, two, three, four, almost five, you know, almost five boxes again. So we had a, we fell, came back, fell again. And we ended up testing two sectors. So what would that be here? We're, this is our one sector fall so far. All right, so to, we will complete this at 4,400. We'll bounce along the 50 day moving average and then we will fall back 200 more points to roughly the strong bounce line. Hopefully it'll hold up. If not, we'll be testing the weak bounce line. But it's just like this and it's perfectly rational. We need to consolidate in all the excitement, in all the people rushing out to pay extra money because there is inflation. You know, you're paying a higher multiple for your stock because there was inflation. And in the end, the inflation is bullshit and doesn't affect the stock's performance in the, in the long run. So everybody takes the inflation data at face value and believes that these stocks are making more money than they really are. And they buy up the stock and give them a multiple on the inflation. That's the joke of this whole thing. When you're in the kind of rally we've been having lately, what are you doing? You're taking that inflation. You're taking that hundred, the $20 profit from apples, from selling apples goes to 22. And you're saying 22, holy crap, they were only making 20 two years ago before we had 10% inflation. So that means they're growing at 10% annual rate. Therefore, in three years, they're going to be making $27 or $28. That's nonsense logic. If that happens, that means we've got runaway inflation that's going to inflate us 30, 40% over the next few years. That's what you're saying. That means the Fed has to raise rates to 18% before they can get a hold of inflation. That's what you're betting on when you're making this bullish bet that your stock is going to keep compounding its, in, its, its, uh, its inflation. It's, it's ridiculous. So many stocks are being carried on this wave like the ai wave also many stocks are being carried on this wave of like infinite growth and extrapolation and it's ridiculous Wait, oh where's my extrapolation card here let's get that uh extrapolation cartoon one of the best economic cartoons ever created this one And there's a variation of this, which I don't see, but anyway. Um, so basically, this is what you're doing. You're extrapolating. Yesterday, it was here. Today, it's here. Therefore, it's going to go here. So I don't mind paying 44 times earnings because it'll be catching up in no time. That's, the, the logic is not there. And where was the other one? I like the other one. There's a two-panel one that uh, takes it to another level. But, you know, I, I have these kind of conversations with people all the time, and it's just I, I, I can't understand how people don't get this stuff. Uh, uh, how could they not have the same court? It's by the same guy. It's the same topic. Ugh, I'm annoyed. Anyway, in the other one, which we cannot find, they the they say it's they, it's silly to have two you can't make an extrapolation on two data points so he goes instead of going instead of waiting for instead of waiting patiently for the next data point like the next earnings report they instead go oh no but if we look back here it was you know all these were like this and now we're on this incredibly upswinging curve so if you add more data points in the back the curve like we had no inflation for many years right so all of a sudden now you're on this incredibly upswinging curve that now your trajectory is going this way instead and it did it really, it did it really well, but it's, uh, oh, I give up. I'm going to waste too much time looking for it. Let's check out these other cartoons. But anyway, you get the point, I hope. <laughs> you just have to. You just have to think about the logic of what's happening. And that is not what we're getting when we look at these markets. 
that's what's scary. And people just extrapolate out these the money, the earnings, and everything else. And you say, well, where where is this going to come from? AI will be a $15 trillion market by 2032. That's something you read all the time, that kind of bullshit. And and where is the $15 trillion going to come from? Our entire global economy is a hundred trillion dollars. So are you saying that AI will be 15% of the entire global economy? It's going to gobble up the planet bit by, it's like Pac-Man, like eating the planet. Where does this money come from? You know, and by the way, stopping the earth from burning is also a $15 trillion business. It's going to cost us $1.5 trillion a year for the next 10 years just to, to try to stabilize things. Where is that money coming from? So now we need that money plus the AI money, plus we need the infrastructure money just to, to, to not, not just the regular spending on global warming, but the infrastructure that has to be put in place for solar and geothermal and whatever to replace our current electric grid. And that's a disaster, by the way, because you're already seeing a blowback in some places, but when you, you know, the reason we haven't had blackouts this summer is because five to 10% of the energy is now, be, is now generated by some form of renewable energy. Uh, that was not the case before. So those are all, those are all businesses, homes and whatever that are coming off the grid. So the, the drain on the grid dropped five to 10%. Plus, we the people using electricity um, being forcing everyone to, to switch to uh, low energy light bulbs and things like that. That's reduced power consumption tremendously too. Um, smart metering, things like that. The nest like you have in your home is like it turns off your thermostat automatically, things like that. These are all saving, saving, saving and stopping us from having the kind of catastrophes we have. The grid is still falling apart, but it, it, you know, it's like if you have a tire and the guy tells you you only have like, uh, you know, he goes, oh, you're going to need these replaced pretty soon. And you say, well, and then you just drive less. So you don't need to replace pretty soon. You're not driving as much. Um, you know, that that's what we're doing. We're just, you know, the grid still needs to be replaced, but we're lessening the load on the grid. So it's not constantly under strain. You know, we were running at maximum capacity for many, many years, and it was killing the grid. There was no way to fix it. Plus, if you fix it, like if you install a new transformer, you have to take the old transformer offline. You're going to cause a blackout <laughs> just by taking the old transformer offline. So it's very, very tricky to do these things. And then, you know, all the energy would have to come from somewhere else. But when you're replacing these massive stations, there, there is nowhere else to, you know, you don't have that much energy to spare. So that's another thing about build, about rebuilding the grid is we have to have the energy to spare. All that's being done, but then the problem is, and everything's connected, because then the problem is if you take 10% of the uh, utility company's customers away, they still have the same cost of producing the electricity that they had before. Their cost is not that dependent on usage. Their cost is based on running a nuclear power plant, running a whatever plant, running a coal plant, whatever the old energy is. They have to run it and keep and, and run the turbines. They don't run it a little slower because it's a little less demand. It doesn't really work that way. They just run, they just shut down a plant. When you put the plant on, it supplies electricity. The electricity flows all over the place, and then people use it. And if they don't, it's pretty much wasted. So what happens with these power plants is um, these electric companies. They now have to say to the to their 90% of the remaining customers, I'm sorry, but these 10% customers are no longer buying electricity from us. You still are. You need to pay 10% more for your electricity. So we can so we can break, and all that does is help us break even. So all these utility companies, and again, it's all slow, slow. It takes so long for these things to happen. But what happens? The utility company has to start losing money. They then go to the power authority in their state and they request a rate increase. The power authority looks over the logic of a rate increase and grants it. So it takes six months a year before these things start changing, but then it changes. Now, what happens? The electric bills go up and now of the 90% of the people who are still customers of the electric company, another 10% of them start 
calling up the solar companies and going, hey, get over here and get me off the stupid grid. So now, and this is already happening, we're already at that second level. So now what's happening is the utility companies are going to the state government and saying, hey, this isn't fair. We need to charge the people who are not using electricity some kind of fee. Instead of paying them, and you know, at first they were paying the solar people to, uh, you know, for their excess energy. If you were hooked up to the grid, you would be off. Now they're saying, no, 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 no. We're not paying you for your excess energy. We are going to charge you just because we exist, <laughs> even though you are no longer using our services. It's crazy. So, um, and that's going to be again. It's all. It's always like that. Though things change, and there's a there's a shift, and it goes one way, then it goes the other way, and eventually there's some kind of equilibrium. But what we really need to do is to have the government. I know this is very commie sounding, but the government needs to take over the utility companies and the government needs to take over the oil companies and wind them down because they are the ones that are getting in the way of changing the power system in this country of changing our usage changing the grid changing the way we use energy all those people they have to be phased out over time but they will but they'll stretch it out as long as they can because they're a capitalist venture and they want to keep making money the government needs to go and say, hey, okay, how much is Exxon? $100 billion? Here's a check. How much is Chevron? $100 billion? Here's a check. The government needs to write checks and take over these companies and turn them into state-run industries with, where they work with the solar companies and with the hydro companies and with the renew other renewables and wind companies. And they, and they have a plan to phase out what they've got and phase in what, what's coming next. And yes, It'll cost trillions of dollars, and that's inevitable. That's that's what we have to do to start fixing the planet, though. You call, I mean, you can call it communism. It's really socialism. It's just socialism. It's not as bad as communism. Uh, it's not a force takeover. You pay them what you. The government has to say, we will buy these companies for whatever their market price is now. And the shareholders cash in, and we say to the shareholders, you know what, you should invest in the freaking renewable companies that we're going to be starting to uh, push. Go make your money there. Don't make your money here anymore. This is not a good place to make money. It's not for the benefit of society. I don't know why people don't get that. Anyway, so they'll be pushing and pulling and pushing and pulling, but probably we're going to settle down in the new range. This is not the new range. I lost it. Oh, well, you know what I mean. So we're going to probably settle in in the new range up around 4,400, and that's going to be down to 4,200 and up to 4,600 is most likely where we're going to range in the market. So from here to here for the year, and we should end up around there, and, we, and our target now for this year is 4,400. And that will depend on other factors, how strong inflation is, and so on and so forth. But Honestly, if there's more, I, and, I, and I stuck to that number because I said even this year, if we have another 10% inflation, that's going to lead to the Fed saying that then then five six percent is not enough. We have to go to eight percent, and if the Fed goes to eight percent, they're absolutely going to hurt the economy tremendously. All right, and that brings us back to the banks, and that's not it. That's an old one. Protect passwords. Go away. Why are you doing this? Oh, it's so big on this thing. Hmm. All right. So let's see. Any questions? Nope. Still genius. All right. Uh, da, 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 da. Right. Okay. So this morning we talked about the banks. We forgot about the banks. That was all the way back in March. So, of course, we forgot it's already August. <laughs> why, why would we think it's still a problem? <laughs> of course, everything was fixed at once, which is not the case. Moody says it's not the case. And it's not just Moody, Stitch also downgraded banks. Everybody's downgrading the banks. There are 10 banks who got downgraded. There are others that are on credit watch. Um, they're shaky. And so we talked about that here. And what you have to realize with the bank is how can I? All right. 
the problem, and again, slow, slow, slow. Everything is slow. And this is a problem. This is a problem we have for March, right? We saw a huge problem, we put a Band-Aid on it, and we forgot all about it. But then it comes back to bite me because you forgot all about it. You know, uh, so it's because it's such a slow moving thing, it's hard to even wrap your head around. People have a very hard time wrapping their heads around things that move very slowly. And, um, For the last, how well? Oh, let's get it. Um, mortgage rate history chart. You know, you don't give Google enough credit for being an AI, but when it, you know you tell it something like that, it looks through all the crap and it figures out what you mean. I mean, imagine how much crap it has to look at where it's not really giving you what you what you thought you were going to get. All right, is this tools, right? Time past year. There we go. All right. So here we are. 30-year mortgages. This line is 5%. Well, no. <laughs> this line, there you go. This line is 5%. So since 2009, from 2009 until, well, I mean, really, from 2009 until last April, every single mortgage in the United States for 14 years was written below 5%. Every single one. And the rates went lower and lower and lower. And what do people do when the rates get low enough? They refinance, right? Somebody calls you up, you get 100 letters in the mail, you could be saving this, you could do that, blah, 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 refinance. And that's perfectly valid. As long as you intend to stay in the house long enough where the fees for refinancing are washed out, you know, if it costs you $2,000, $3,000 to refinance, and all you're going to do is say, and, and that that right there would be 300 uh, uh, for 300 a month for um, a year or so, right? So if it's going to cost you 300 a month, and all you're going to save on your mortgage is going to be uh, 150 a month, then you damn well better be there for at least two, three more years. Otherwise, you're not even going to make your money back on the refinance. But basically, that math works for most people. If you intend to stay in your home, you refinance your home. It makes sense. Everyone's going to tell you that. Your accountant's going to tell you that. Your friends are going to tell you that. Your mortgage broker's going to tell you that. Your realtor's going to tell you that. They all tell you to refinance. So people refinance. Um, most people did not refinance with adjustable rate mortgages because, again, uh, advisors will tell you how long do you think rates are going to stay at three percent? You, you're not going to get better. You don't. You don't refinance when it hits three percent. You don't refinance hoping it's going to go to two percent. That's just not going to happen. You know, what do you think? You need a zero percent rate on your home and you need to just pay the you know pay it off whenever. It's not how it goes. So anyway, so the a vast majority, turns out more than a third, I mean I, I think almost half of the homes have mortgage rates that are below 3.5% right now. 30 year mortgage is below 3.5%. The now this is the um so now this isn't even that right seven percent so now it's now it's seven percent so it's double but the banks don't borrow at 30 year periods they borrow two years six months five year that five years is a stretch for a bank to be borrowing money you know they mostly borrow very short-term money the logic is that whatever short-term money they borrow at now they're going to then write a mortgage for a higher amount and and again, going back to 1987, this has never been a bad strategy for the banks. All right, so since I graduated college, basically, this has never been a bad idea for the banks. So 40 years ago, not 40, 40 was high school, but whatever. Anyway, 40 years ago, 
people were going, well, here you go. It's 1981, right? So there you go. Rates were insane. Yeah. Yeah, so when I went to high school, <laughs> that was the rate that was the rate that you would get. And they, and it wasn't a short term. This is from 1981 in, in July until basically the next July. So for an entire year, rates were in the 15% range, above 15%. Actually, above 15% was from Dece December 80 to 82, September 82, two whole years. Rates were not below 15% for two whole years. But since then, down, 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 down. So people grew up, went to college, became mortgage brokers, and they have never heard of anything like rates going up significantly. They have never formed a strategy in which rates grow up significantly. There are people who became teachers and went to school and studied for years and learned a lot of stuff. And then they taught students and their teacher who went to, you know, graduated high school here and came into the market here. And this is his experience. He starts teaching students from that experience. This is what happens when you're a bank. Here you go, Mr. Banker, Mr. Future Banker. This is what we're gonna teach you. You always take the refi money because eventually, you always take the short-term money so you can go out and lend. And whatever the rates are, they usually go up and down, but you're always gonna be borrowing cheaper and lending higher. And then you cycle through and you borrow cheaper again. But what happens when that cycle breaks? Nobody has any freaking idea unless they're 70 years old. Or unless they're, uh, <laughs> unless they're a 60 year old guy like me who actually paid attention at the time. And that's only because my grandfather was seriously into the stuff and he'd always talk to me about it. So, you know, I, I, me and my grandfather was our conversations when we were hanging out. We'd be like talking about money and finance and things like that. Um, so unless you're 70 years old and, 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 and I don't believe me, I'm surrounded by 70 year olds in Florida and they do not know what the fuck is going on. <laughs> for the most part, I'm sure some of you guys are really sharp, but you know you're on a you're on a very select site, so keep that in mind. But I'm surrounded by 70 year olds, so I wouldn't take a penny's worth of financial advice from. Um, unless you go back to these old folks who remember what this was like, you have no idea what to do about this. The CEOs aren't even 70 years old; they pretty much kick them out by then. So you got a 40, 50 year old guy running a bank and all he knows is this. And his advisors only know this and everybody only knows this. And they're playing it wrong and they're doing it wrong, but it's going to hurt and hurt and hurt for years. Years, 1971, 1981, 10 years of up. And this Fed wants to pretend that after one year of sudden rises, it's going to go away. Ah, uh, we tried that. We tried the year of sudden rises. We tried it a couple of times. This doesn't go back far enough. We tried a year of sudden rises. Doesn't work. We tried this sudden rise. Doesn't work. It wasn't enough. Well, this was enough. It finally broke apparently. But you know, I mean, this is incredibly painful, horrible stuff. And you know, this rise caused a recession. This rise caused a recession. This rise hasn't caused a recession yet. That doesn't mean it won't cause a recession. So here's the problem. All these homes, every almost every home in existence has a mortgage rate below 5%. And the banks now can't borrow money at 5%. So they're collecting interest from the home at below 5% and they're paying more than 5%. They're losing money on the mortgages and the mortgages are pretty much all their money. You know, banks make some business loans here and there and that and that, but most banks, mortgages are their whole deal. The leverage is insane because the banks lend out at 10 to 1. Their reserve ratio is 10%. So that means that they have if they have a million dollars, they get to lend out $10 million. And they, as long as they have a million, they can lend 10 to one against that million. But that means that the losses are 10 times what you think they are. So if a bank, you say, oh, well, so the bank's losing 1% on a mortgage, what's the big deal? No, it's really 10% because they have 10 mortgages that they're losing 1% on. 
And if they don't have the reserves, the reserves dwindle. And that's why I talked about this today. You got to think it through. So I wrote this, how banks make money, blah, blah, blah. Uh, um, okay, yeah. So if the Fed raises its funds rate, this is very important, very learn, very good learning material here, actually. Uh, if the Fed raises its fund rates 5%, the banks have two problems. Okay, the interest will increase and the, and, and the interest income will decrease. The bank can try to mitigate it by, okay, what can they do? They can increase their fees or charges. They're just like the utility companies, right? They got to charge new people more money. And that draw and that lowers, and that's exactly what you're seeing with mortgage applications again down 3%. This is the summer when everybody moves. Mortgage applications are supposed to be up and up and up until September when school starts again and everybody settles down, right? Because you want to move, you know, between the school years. You don't want to move in, in the school year if you're that kind of family. Um, most homes turn over in the summers. So oddly enough, we're having a terrible summer. We've been having terrible turnover because the people who have a 3.5% mortgage can't afford to trade it in for a 7% mortgage. They can't afford to leave the home. It's not that they can't afford to leave the home. They can't afford to leave the mortgage. That's the problem. And the banks can't afford for them to stay in the home with that mortgage. That's the problem for the banks. So what can the banks do? Same as utility company. They've got to stick it to their remaining customers. They've got to cut their salaries, cut their rents, cut their marketing. That leads to more problems with commercial real estate and less people with money to spend. That means less people to buy homes and so on and so forth. They can sell some of their portfolio to other investors, which is uh, unlikely. The Fed just took away $2 trillion worth of uh, deposits already. Now they've got it. So China took away hundreds of billions of dollars worth of of homes took them away from Evergrande and other companies. So that China's gonna take the loss instead of the companies, but it's either way, it's a loss. Somebody's losing money. And so, so it's that, or they can diversify their revenue streams by offering new products and services, but those products and services tend to be more risky. And that bank should not be in a risky business, but if this forces them to be in a risky business, then if we have a downturn, the banks collapse. That's what happened in 1987. It's also what happened in 2008, because we've been learning our lesson in 1987. <laughs> it's all so stupid when you think about it, it really is. And you know why it's stupid? Because, it, because we're not socialized. That's why the European banks are kicking their ass right now, because they have serious oversight. They tell the banks what to do. They sit, they, they sit down with the banks and say, okay, here's what we're doing. Here's how we're going to conduct business. And the banks hate it, but then they say, well, thank God we're not America, where they just do what they want and everybody gets screwed. Um, and again, so the banks to try to do these things, they run into regulatory problems. So they can't even do it when they want to. It's a big problem for the banks. Um, oh, that was weird. How did that little box come up? That was kind of cool. Oh, there it is. That is so interesting. Weird. Um, anyway, so who got downgraded? Oh, I'm sorry. I talked. Then I talked about something else. Where was that discussion? It was up here. Da, 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 da. Hmm. All right, anyway, oh, oh I was just talking about right here. Okay, so the difference between interest income and interest expense is NIM. NIM is the bank's profitability. What's the spread? That's what it is, it's spread, just like any bookie. Okay, so they're they're buying at a certain, they're buying money at a certain price and they're selling it at a certain price. They hope to be selling it for more than they're buying it for. This is the problem though when it flips around. This is the problem. They they expected this to continue. They had no reason, no reason in the life experience of anybody under 70 years old, they have no reason to think 
that this is going to change. We make people retire at 65. We kick them out of the companies. There's almost nobody left who actually remembers what happened before this. They have no idea. It's outside of their entire life experience. You can read about it in a book the same way you can read about the, 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 the crash of 1929. Uh, it's just unrealistic. It's You read about it, you hear, understand it, kind of, sort of. You can I can write a thesis about the, 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 the causes and the relationships and the this and that and what really, you know, what, what happened. It was, you know, again, just it was an investing bubble. It was an investing bubble. And at the same time, then we got hit by a huge drought. And uh, the, the 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 farmers who had been who had a, a lot of money had gone into farming, Mechani you know, the, the automation of farming was starting back then. A lot of money went into creating these bigger and bigger farms. They over um, they uh, they over uh, they over harvested on the land, and they ruined the you know they didn't they 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 just over planted, over harvested, so on and so forth. Because we were exporting to the whole world, it was like an infinite amount of food we were sending out of the country. There's nothing you couldn't sell. But what we did is we raped the land, we wrecked it. Then the then it then we had a drought. Then the land was the the, the soil was not um anchored as it as it should have been. And um and farms got wiped out, farmers got wiped out, towns got wiped out, banks got wiped out, and it spread and spread and spread until everything collapsed. That's essentially what happened in 1929. Poor central planning. Same thing that always happens in America. You can always point your finger at lack of central planning. And, and not that the central planners do much better, but it's 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 funny how like a little bit a little bit of planning wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. So where were we? Um yeah. So net interest margin is what we're looking at in the banks. It's a simple way to kind of take a look at where it is. And um but these are the banks that are failing. So we're looking at, at a range, and I was interested. It's like so basically around three percent is is trouble. That's actually getting these guys a downgrade. It's not the only reason they're getting a downgrade, but it certainly indicates where the, where Moody's thinks you should be, and that means over three percent for sure. You know, Am, I don't know what Amarillo National Bank Corp's actual problem is, but it's certainly not the net interest margin. Now on the other hand. Why are these guys under review? Well, that's pretty freaking clear, isn't it? Higher is better, okay? Their interest margin is down to 95. Oh, I'm sorry. And all these interest margins are shrinking. Again, it goes back to their interest margin now is 3.4%, but that means because they've lent out money at a certain price and they have been, they, they've taken in money at these low rates, like low rate savings accounts where they haven't been paying us any interest for the last 10 years, right? Um, the banks have gotten our money for free and then lent it out. So that's been a great racket for them. But as it as this turns over and the money turns over and new people putting deposits in expect to get 5% in their savings account, like I used to get when I was a kid, um, they are now no longer satisfied with that. You used to get 5% and you used to get a toaster or a bike or a baseball. You, got, you always got something for opening a bank account back in the day. Um, so who's in trouble? They don't, they're on a tightrope. If this goes negative, your bank is closed. So three, three percent, four percent is great. Three percent is good. Below three percent, you're getting dangerous. These guys are already at one percent, one percent, one percent. These banks are in serious trouble. And these are big banks, Northern Trust, State Street, and Bank of New York. And when the commercial market starts to fall apart, what are they going to draw? Okay, then then you got Colin Frost here, U.S. Bank Corp. Also, it's tight margins. And then these guys who are who are negative outlook, also three, they basically all in the three percent range. Okay, so they're they're these are the only banks they rated. They didn't rate any bank and said this bank is great. <laughs> this is what they found. So we have a very, very big problem, and um, and th these guys put possible downgrades. I'm very, very concerned about these. These one percenters are in big trouble, and these are big banks. Let 
of that. Oh, okay. Uh, bu, 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 okay, that's all good then. So now we know about that. What else has happened? Well, how's the market doing? Let's take a look. Yep, see, so Hope Springs Eternal Low, we're holding on. Here's that 45 line, good job. <laughs> Russell has been the big indicator, it just has not been able to get over 2,000. Well, we didn't even get past the S&P, got so distracted. Uh, da, 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 da. Here we go, S&P, NASDAQ. It's too long, weekly, not really. Although, yeah, actually, it's important. Keep in mind that, you know, the NASDAQ was 16.7. The S&P was 4,800. The Dow. So, you know, you think about this as like this huge rally, but it's only a huge rally because we fell so much. We're only just getting back to where we where we made progress to after two years from um, 2020. And why was that, though? Here's the problem. Stimulus. There was massive amounts of stimulus that drove us up here, that drove the, the profits of these companies. We don't have that anymore. We're not throwing money into the economy like we used to. We're still throwing money into the economy, not like we used to. The Russell was at 24,000. We can't even get back to 2,000. 2,000 is giving them trouble. They were at 2,400. So it's already dropped 20%, and it still is having trouble justifying that. So here's the thing. If the Russell stocks, which are, mm, I, I mean, I would say they're 500 million to to 5 billion range in that in that sort of range for the Russell 2000. If the Russell stocks can't justify 2000 and end up back at 1800, which is back where we were before COVID, right? Then what does that mean for the Nasdaq? Wow. Are these guys are these guys really that superior? Fifty here, this is fifty percent higher. This is fifty percent higher. This is hmm, let's give give them that. Let's say twenty-eight to thirty-five is seven. It's not that much actually, it's twenty-five percent higher. So the Dow's only twenty-five percent higher. The Nasdaq and S P are fifty percent higher than pre-COVID. And they're, they're really not making the money to justify it. It's really a multiple expansion. It's not, a, it's not an earnings expansion. It's a multiple expansion. And that's a really dangerous market to invest in. Because you're, you're betting that there's somebody stupider than you who's going to pay 33% for your company when you're ready to sell it. You're buying it for 30, I'm sorry, you're buying it for 30 times earnings, and you're betting that you're going to find a guy to pay 33 times earnings. And that guy's going to bet that somebody's going to pay 40 times earnings. Oh, <laughs> that reminds me. Speaking, speaking of that, as, as you've probably read, there are insurance companies are bailing out of Florida and California. Too many fires, floods, blah, blah, blah. Too many disasters. Global warming has made a trend that has made insurance companies say these states are not worth the risk. We are no longer covering people in these states. So that leaves, again, now the ones who are left are gonna charge much more for insurance rates, so on and so forth. But that's, again, it's so slow, it's hard to imagine what's happening. But what's happening is when you buy a home, the bank is lending you money. So let's say I'm buying a $500,000 house in Florida. The bank is lending me money based on the fact that I'm going to insure it and I can afford to insure it and pay off the mortgage and do everything else, right, going forward. That's number one, because I'm a partner with the bank on this. I'm only putting up 10%, 20%, whatever. So let's say I put up 100,000, the bank puts up 400,000. So the bank needs my house not to burn down, needs my house not to be washed out to sea, flooded, whatever, needs not to be knocked down by a hurricane. Um, they, they are gonna make sure I have insurance for all these things. That insurance rate keeps climbing, it's gonna impact my ability to pay the bank. Also, if the bank ends up having to foreclose on me, they've gotta pay that huge insurance rate, right? 
but that's not the only thing. Also, when you're buying a home, the supposition is that you are going to live in that home for probably 10 years. You're probably going to be in there for 10 years. That's the, about the average for a person buying a home and staying in it. Um, the problem for the banks now, and they're running the same numbers that the insurance companies are running, and what they're saying is, here's the problem. In 10 years, we, the bank, and the person who bought the home with the bank is going to try to sell that property. At the time, the person will still owe the bank most of the money. All right, I mean, that's an amortization table. So let's see. Um, I'm sure you guys know how this works. Amortization calculator. All right, so you got a $400,000 loan. And it's 30 years, and your interest rate is 7%. I don't know where somebody's getting 5%, 7.00%. Start in 4043. So your monthly payment is $2,600. You're going to pay half a million dollars of interest. That sucks. Um, you're going to pay almost um, you're going to pay almost 150 percent of your loan amount in interest. That's crazy. Um, ba -ba -bum. And oh, does this not show you the? Um, uh, oh, okay, okay, good. All right. So ten years from now, what's going to happen? Your loan balance is still 343. There you go. All you've done in the first ten years of your of your mortgage. I can't point because it moves the thing all you've done in the first 10 years you i'm pointing at the screen just imagine where it says interest paid all you've done in the first 10 years of your mortgage is pay is pay two hundred sixty two thousand dollars in interest you've only paid down fifty six thousand dollars of principal that's that's a freaking nightmare so your loan balance is still 343 so as you know there's always been the the expectation that your home value would have increased significantly by then but that is no longer the case either and here's where it gets worse because the bank, in order to get their money out of a, of the five hundred thousand dollar home, they've got to sell it for at least three forty three. Well, you you the you the homeowner are not going to sell it, so you'll, they'll be sitting on that place. Um, so you've got to get out for three forty three. But the problem is when you get out, when you go to sell your home in ten years, global warming is ten years further along the line, and Every insurance company has left Florida and your property is effectively uninsurable. The, also, the new banks are going to come in and look at the trend of the last 10 years and say, I'm not lending you money to buy a home in Florida. You're a moron. It's going to be underwater in 10 more years. Um, so the homes will become unsellable. And that means nobody will buy them. So if the homes are going to be unsellable in 10 years, it's not going to be very long before the banks realize this now and won't even lend you money now for a home. Because 10 years is their cutoff. It's like if they can't see you selling the home and getting their money back in 10 years, why are they going to lend this money? It doesn't make any sense. You can't count on the property going up in value. And you certainly can't count on the property going up in value when the whole place is going underwater. Um, Florida underwater animated GIF. Uh, underwater, no. Florida, Florida rising sea levels animated GIF. Here you go. So let's see what looks right. All right, so this is like Orlando. Miami is about here. So, you know, when I say Florida, I mean this, you know, I mean, the part of Florida people care about, nobody <laughs> really cares what happens up north. Um, this is what's happening. And it's not, it's not not happening, it is happening. It just happens so slowly you don't realize it, but over the next, 100 years, 
this is what's going to happen. All the way up to Orlando is gone. In 50 years, Miami will be gone. So and that is, and it's always, of course, unless we do something, but of course, we, unless we do something, it's, <laughs> it's, we aren't doing anything. So you have to be realistic and say, well, we aren't doing anything. So the thing is, if I'm a bank and you want to buy a condo over here and it's going to be underwater in 20, 30 years, why would I, why do I want to get involved in that? And it's going to make all of this area uninhabitable, unlendable, so on and so forth. And this is a shorter, much shorter term. You know, as it stands, it's looking worse and worse as we look at it. Miami Beach, present day, 2017. You know, it looks like Venice. <laughs> oh, that's bad. But that, and those are the condos. Everything else is gone. It's going to look like Water World. So the thing, so so nobody is taking this stuff into account because again, nobody, you know, everyone's everyone's too young. I'm 60, and, and I'm sorry. I look at these CEOs. It's, ama it's amazing to me that these CEOs are like 50, 40, 50 years old now. It just blows my mind. Um, but it's it's really it's nothing against you know younger people. I mean, there's you know there's plenty of smart younger people, but you're smart within the range of what you've experienced in life. And this is very hard to wrap your head around, and 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 everybody wants to believe that that's not going to happen. But it is happening. And so you're just basically refusing to you're refusing to accept the fact that it's happening. But the banks can't do that. The insurance companies, insurance companies run hundred percent on actu 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 uh, actuaries, you know, on the actuarial tables. The insurance companies are gonna make a blend, a decision based on the facts, and that's the only decision they're gonna make. And they are getting out of Florida. Florida and California are too risky. The entire, you know, and of course, you'd say, oh, it's not the whole state. What about up north and so on and so forth? They don't they cut this state. They're like, this is crazy. It's going to be insane. And it starts with the insurance companies. Then it'll be the banks and they will refuse to lend. And that means if you buy a house in Florida now, if the banks change their minds about lending in Florida in the next 10 years, and that'll be a forced, if there's no one to insure it, it'll be forced anyway. But if the banks won't lend, then you're stuck with whatever you buy. So think about that carefully before you move to Florida. Because <laughs> you, you may not be able to unload your property. And, and the waters will keep rising. And in fact, the, frankly, the, as soon as you start realizing, oh, Phil was right, I should have sold my property because we had three floods this year, or, or the hurricane was 140 miles an hour and ripped the roof off the house and nobody will insure it. That's what I'm saying. The ocean is 100 degrees. It's like a hot tub to go in the ocean. It is 100 degrees in the ocean. The sand is 120. It's not. It's just a day. It's not even worth going to the beach right now. Um, you go from blazing hot sand to a boiling hot ocean, and it's no relief. It's just like I really would have rather said, you know, that's what that's what happens. I'm like, I would rather sit home with the air conditioning. I watch a a picture of the uh, ocean. Because I'm much, much happier here. I got a pool outside. I go swim in the pool. That's fine. Pool's still too hot, also. Um, but, the, you know, nobody sees this stuff coming. And I'm telling you, it's coming. The banks will stop lending in the next 10 years or less. The banks will stop lending in Florida without some kind of special coverage or so on and so forth. You won't be able to buy a home because nobody will lend you money to buy it. And that's when it all starts falling apart. And how would without and and when you wipe out the tourism in southern Florida, when you wipe, you know, and oh, and by the way, not to mention at the beach, there is 
ridiculous, horrible seaweed everywhere because of this giant seaweed patch. And again, global warming, better, warmer temperatures, bigger seaweed patch, blah, blah, blah. Um, but when the banks stop lending and you can't buy a home and people are stuck with their homes, they're going to fire sale their homes, try to get out of it. People are going to run out of the state. The tourists won't come to here anymore. And the uh, the base of the uh, capital, the, the capital base of the state is going to erode. And what's going to happen? The state turns to the people who are left. And the people who are left are a much poorer demographic than the people who are going to be getting out. And they're going to turn to them and say, hey, hey you guys got to pay up. You got to pay up so we can keep running the state. Still need to run the state. It's even, even even more so now that it's half underwater. It's going to be worse. You know, you got to you got to every everything is going to be a catastrophe again because you won't admit it because you won't deal with it now. It's going to be a surprise catastrophe later for the budget. Year after year after year. So oh, I'm sorry. Forgot about the oceans. So the oceans, 100 degrees. Hurricanes feed off warm water. That's why they happen during the summer. They 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 feed off warm water. We're getting missed right now because of the hurricanes, because of the warm water. The hurricanes are not hitting us, they're hitting other places. But if we get hit, it's going to be massive because there is nothing to slow them down. They are going to come full force because you know it, there used to be they would feed until they until they start losing steam as they got close to the land, but the land is hot, the ocean is hot. Everything is there's nothing to slow these things down other than they run out of water, and that's going to take a long time. So, the coasts of uh, Florida are going to get hit very badly, and so are other coastal places by hurricanes. Um, and, and homes are built to withstand a reasonable amount of stress, right? So, homes are built uh, category five hurricane resistance homes, which is the top level, is up to 120 miles an hour. You're supposed to be able to withstand 120 miles an hour. We're going to start having to call things Category 6. They're going to be 150 mile an hour sustained winds. There's not too much construction that can take that. So hurricane damage is going to start looking like tornado damage, except that it's going to affect massively wider places. And tornado, tornadoes are very house-focused. Like the, 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 the actual damage of a tornado is about the size of a house at the, at the point of pain, where it's 180 miles an hour. Um, and, but a, and, and whatever path of destruction it makes around there is about how big it's going to be. A hurricane, though, is miles and miles wide, and you're going to have a 150-mile-an-hour hurricane. That's, that's just insane. So, you know, and again, it's, it's just so slow-moving, people don't pay attention to it. And, and you watch these insurance companies pulling out of Florida, and people don't understand what insurance is for. If you can't insure your property, the bank's not going to lend you money on the property. And if you can't get loans on the property, you can't buy property. Therefore, people can't sell their property. Therefore, everybody's going to start losing money on their houses. And then the banks go bankrupt anyway. So partially because they stop lending, but if they, you know, it's a tough, tough call, right? But if the bank stops lending, then what are they saying about their own portfolio of, of homes that are based in Florida? So it's easier for insurance companies. They say, well, we're just not insuring you anymore. Goodbye. You know, they close up shop. They have no uh, underlying risk. They, they, you, your insurance policy ends, and that's why they're doing it now, because it's ending before this, these major storms start hitting us. They don't want to be here anymore. So they're announcing that they're pulling out of states and no longer lending these states because, you know, California's burning. We're getting flooded out. And, um, and they don't, and, you know, it's getting worse and worse. And they have to stop now so that a year from now, they will have no more existing policies. There's no renewals. The banks are in a different situation, though. The banks already have tremendous amount of investments already in this region. And they can't force their way out of the mortgages. The mortgages are up to the homeowners. The homeowners have to decide to quit. And, like, and so, like I said, so if the banks say, we're not lending in Florida anymore, that sets off alarm bills that can knock down all of their existing portfolio. Just like Buffett last week got out and said, I think bonds are great. It's like, yeah, you, you have $200 billion worth. <laughs> That's why you think they're great. <laughs> you know, of course, you're going to sit there and talk up the bonds. 
And that's what the banks have to do. The banks have to pretend everything's fine. It's not fine. It is not fine. We have huge problems coming. So needless to say, we're, we're being very cautious about our investments in finance. We're very cautious about our REITs. And, that, and, that, and on top of that, you have the whole commercial real estate thing is still collapsing. And again, it's so slow that you almost think it's not happening, but it is. It just takes time for these things to hit. Okay, I mean, are they, they, you know, Moody's just downgraded the banks. They didn't downgrade the REITs. That's, that's next. But you'll see the 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 big exposure in this in down in southern Florida, big exposure in southern Florida, biggest mistake you could possibly make. Um I, I had a friend of mine who was gonna get a building down here. I said, don't buy it. <laughs> like, don't don't do it. It's just not a good move. It's it's hard. It's hard to to think of how this works. So you you know, we gotta look at these banks, we gotta figure out where their loans are, where their exposure is, and how we're gonna do it. But that's the gist of where we are at the moment. It's a very precarious position, and it's um, outside of the experience of almost anybody you will see talking. You know, and that that's where, oh, well, I lost that Fed one. No worry. Fed, Fed, Fed. Oh, oh look at all the stuff we talked about. There it is. Anybody who, well, I'm 60, so I, I basically I got to tell you because I mean I'm I'm abnormal. I think I certainly paid a lot more attention to finance and so on and so forth when I graduated. But let's say anybody older than me, who's a, anybody younger than me, younger than 60, they were it was their high school before. But you know this they were they were they were not even finishing high school when the economy started changing and we started going, everything started being less and less, lower and lower rates, lower and lower inflation every single year, you know, nonstop trend. They've never had to deal with any of this. It hasn't happened at all in their entire lives. So, as I said, that's high school for me, not college. So, I, so I'm 60. And I'm telling you that anybody younger than 60, because I'm not a normal person, <laughs> anybody younger than 60, there's no way that they have a good grasp on this situation. And and really, I would have to say a normal, normal, normal people around 70 years old. And so that means almost everybody has aged out and retired who would actually have a good handle on what to do with this stuff. And 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 it's going to be hard. It's going to there's, there's a lot of problems, and they're all piling up one by one by one. But it's a brick by brick, piece by piece, and you almost don't notice that it's happening, but it is happening. And you got to take it seriously. It's it's you know, and again, I'm not saying it's imminently going to collapse or blah blah blah. But over the next ten years, you're going to see some serious shit happen. So if you're young enough to care, I'd start caring. So the next step is going to be we'll have to analyze these banks. We're going to have to figure out who's in real trouble. Um, you know, but it, but again, if we're talking about uh, Mellon is BK and TRS and State Street. Let's take a look. So BK. So Mellon is a $35 billion bank. Northern Trust is a $16 billion bank. Oh, by the way, it's not about the bank, though. It's about how much. Look, $135 billion under management. Fixed assets, $150 billion. That's what's at risk here. $408 billion. And the problem with Bank of New York is that they've got uh, too much... Um, that's State Street, State Street. They've got too much um, uh, commercial. Oh, wait a minute, let's go back to that. What is this? Why did it do that? 
STT. There it is. State Street's 23 billion, and they've got 285 billion. So BK is the one you should worry about. But watch it. Look what, what look at what BK has. Oh no, it wasn't. But yeah. No, they're they've got they've got cash. I'm sorry, it's not them. It's um the NT. Is in TRS. Eleven no is State Street. Nope, I read it wrong. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I thought somebody had a negative book value, but I didn't. I, it's not not correct. Um. So, you know, these banks, they don't look bad on paper unless you start wondering, well, what are these assets? You know, it's like it's like if you apply for a loan, like Trump does this, right? He applies for a loan and he says, I've got uh, $40 billion of assets and $25 billion of it is the Trump brand name. And then, and then, you know, you don't see it, it's declared on his balance sheet as an asset. And he's like, oh, uh, my Trump brand name is worth $15 billion. And that's why I'm a billionaire, because I'm, I'm so far, you know, I'm so far on the black on my on my net value. But is somebody going to really buy that for $15 billion? No. Until you look at the assets and really value them properly, you're never going to know what anything is worth. And that's why you got to be careful because the, the book value of this bank is $22 billion. It means if you write down 10% of these assets, that book value turns negative. So Northern Trust has a net book value of 11. And again, 10% wiped out their book value. And by the way, it's an $11 billion book value, but the bank is currently 16.4. And Mellon has a $36 billion book value, but still a 10% downward adjustment would wipe them out. And they're 35. So they're, these are the only, Mellon is the only one actually trading their book value. Oh, the enterprise value. That's what I noticed. I'm sorry. There it was. Look at this enterprise value. Minus $29 billion. <laughs> that's really bad. That's what I, that's what I caught. I'm sorry. I, I thought it was a book value. Look, see, enterprise value, 152. And State Street has an enterprise value of 42. All right, let's go back to BK. Minus 29. Enterprise value represents uh, a complete evaluation of company size and the market cap. It has net debt and the value of equity uh, is market cap plus net debt, blah, blah, blah. It's negative 29. Uh, oh, dear. Okay, this is bad. And, and, oh, you know what else is bad? This is bad. Okay? And again, nobody has this experience. It's beyond the understanding of the people who are running the bank. Oh, and here they are. 67, 54, 51, 59, 61, 51, 66, 58, 57, 48, 42, 44, 64, 59, 51. Nobody is old enough to have dealt with this before. Now, hopefully they had mentors who told them some stuff and they listened like my grandfather, you know, and, and that's the reason I'm so financially aware is my grandfather used to tell me what happened in the depression and how the businesses failed and how the banks failed. And he told me what happened during the war and what happened in this time and that time. He had a great perspective on everything for having, you know, lived since 1903. He grew up it's when he was a, when he was a teenager, World War II, World War I started. Uh, when he, when he first had a kid, World War II started. 
he kind of he was lucky he missed he was like at the wrong age for at both times he was a little too old in world war ii and a little too young in world war one thank god um and then about oh, i'm sorry and then in the middle of those was the great depression when he was first trying to go out and make a living in the world he sold dresses door to door that was what he did in the great depression he was a traveling salesman with a he had a, a suitcase full of dresses and he would go to house to house to house to see if women needed to buy a dress um then there was um so then we had world war ii and then you know and then the industrial revolution not the industrial revolution whatever you call it in the 50s and 60s the reindustrialization um he had just such a good perspective on everything and i used to really be interested in it you know I, it wasn't just like an old guy talking he's real smart and i used to listen to everything he said um but it gave me a lot of perspective when I grew up. So, I mean, some guys had to have mentors and people like that who told them these things. And ho hopefully there's somebody, but this is outside. This is this wouldn't happen if these guys were all on the ball. They mismanaged their funds. And 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 they and this is only the beginning because this, those mortgages are still out there. The risk is still out there. Look at and look at these freaking projections. Look how they project that they're going to turn it around all at once. <laughs> oh my God, it's so scary. You know, if, if if commercial real estate collapses, these guys are so totally screwed. If New York, you know, and and, and you know, if New York doesn't come back, and if they can't figure out what to do with all this empty space. And they've got all this money lent out, and it's a hundred million here and fifty million there. These are really expensive deals, and they're and they're going bust one after the other. And that's what happened to Evergrande in China. It's a hundred and eighty billion dollars, and it all went up in smoke. The buildings are still there. Some are half built. Some are half, some are some are empty. Some are half empty. Some are half built. And they're not going to get built because there's no more money. You know, China, China's government bailed Evergrande out of basically not not bailed them out, absorbed all the losses. But now another one is failing in China. Another huge developer is failing in China, and we started talking about Evergrande before COVID. We were talking about Evergrande being a problem, and all this time they've been falling apart. Look at WeWork. How long have we known WeWork was going to collapse? I can't believe it's still there. I was surprised a few months ago when I was looking at WeWork, going, "How the hell are they still in business?" And you know why? Because it's real estate, and when you're in real estate, it takes a long time to die. You know, WeWork has long-term contracts. They sell short-term space. The disruption in the in the real estate, the disruption in commercial real estate has been good for WeWork as far as there's been a lot of people who are between offices and need temporary stuff. And that's helped them a bit, but not enough. And now they're going, now they're going bust. They signed too many long-term commercial leases. They did not fill it up with enough customers. COVID happened and they were empty for a couple of years, and now not enough people are coming back to support them even if their lenders capitulated and helped them. And there's a WeWork thing, that, there's a, a movie about WeWork and how it fell apart. Um, what's that called? Uh, we work movie. Was it a movie or a series? Hulu. The making and breaking of a $47 billion unicorn. All right, so definitely watch that. We crashed, that's what it was. Oh, that's different. There's two different things. There's we crashed on um, on Apple TV and there's we work on Hulu. We crashed is really good. Um, I don't know about the other one. The other one I think is new. No, it's not new, it's apparently old. Oh, well. Anyway, we crashed is the one I watched. That was really fascinating. I mean, if you're, just, if you're into that kind of stuff, it's just interesting to see how they built this company and people and again remember it's a hundred times earnings i mean more than 100 they weren't even making money and they're getting these insane valuations 
And you just see the madness of the whole thing. And the bullshit that goes on behind the scenes. They're just trying to keep their phony baloney jobs going. And that's what this is. And you can't fix it. They brought in the CEO to fix it. The CEO bailed after a very short amount of time. They have, I think two years ago, they brought in a new guy to turn it around, a CEO. And I think, I think within six months, he was gone. He was like, this is not fixable. It's like it's like bringing a new captain on the Titanic as it's sinking. You know, it's like, it's like oh, what am I going to do? He's like, no, you're a great captain. It's like, it doesn't matter if I'm a great captain. You've got a giant hole in the ship and it's sinking into the ice. And that's how things are. Oh, yeah, this guy, Jared Leto, he's good. He was a joker in some other movie. That was fun. And she's great. It was good. <laughs> anyway, all right. I got to stop talking. So where were we? Oh, yes, banks. Stay away. Yes, banks. <laughs> Very dangerous. We're going to have to figure out how dangerous. But you got you to realize this is, these, these, these are, this is a trillion dollars worth of properties. A trillion dollars worth of properties in these banks. massive i mean it's more than we can afford to bail out and that's just those guys these guys these guys were already downgraded these are only on watch it, you know they're under review these guys have already been downgraded and m and t is huge um pinnacle is huge comics oh <laughs> comics comics is also huge so again there's another trillion already downgraded so that downgrade means now it's going to cost them more money to borrow money than before. They're going to have a hard time selling their notes versus other banks who are selling notes. They'll have to offer more. They start offering more. Even the banks see they start offering more rate for their for their bonds, and the other banks have to start offering more rate for their bonds because it's kind of hard to explain to uh, bond buyers that. I mean, not intelligent bond buyers, but but the, there's plenty of people who buy bonds and don't pay enough attention to the risk of the bank. But there is also, again, insurance comes into play. When you buy the bond, you buy you buy insurance, and the insurance company is sure, certainly going to make you aware of the fact that this bank is risky, and it will cost more to insure your bond. So you might get uh, 1% more for the bond, but you're going to pay a half a percent more for insurance. But that then causes people to buy the bonds without the insurance, and then that's where they will lose money too. Fun. But everything is connected. That's the key. Everything is connected in a very dangerous way. And that's what we've got to keep our eye on right now. All right. So that's all for now. And um, um, next week is going to be options expiration week. So we're going to have a lot to talk about in the portfolio. So I'll probably do the portfolio review before the webinar. So uh, plan that for your calendars because next week is going to be super active. All right. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Have a good day. See you next week.